Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Kamala. Uh, thank you, Faye. Um, thank you, all other directors of the CCGI on with us this morning. And good morning to everyone. Um, a special good morning to Mrs. Folks Golson, who, as Kamala mentioned, um, I was lucky enough to be able to pursue um, a master's in corporate and commercial law several years ago. And Mrs. Folks Golson was my one of my lecturers and was very supportive in, in seeing me through that process, especially with respect to corporate governance. So special good morning to her. All right, so let me just try to share my screen. So again, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to spend some time with, with all of you this morning. Um, I'm grateful that the CCGI not only continues to lead this dialogue and drive these discussions within the region, because I do think that they're vital, um, but also specifically that they've allowed me this morning to share some thoughts on governance in the private sector within the Caribbean region. Um, we do need to continue to have these conversations to support the growth um, of our region as a whole. Um, so, you know, I think we know all too well what our region has gone through over the last couple of years and what our private sector um, has had to endure because of COVID, because of the other dynamics within our economies. Um, and we've, we've weathered some very difficult years. And I think that's going to continue to be the case over the next few years as we try to rebuild and, and grow our economies. The private sector within the region has a really important role to play um, in setting the benchmark for how we move forward in leading the way, exemplifying the right ethical behavior, um, accountability and trust so that we can then demand these things of our governments and our, our public sector, our legislators and our regulators. Um, it's vital because the, our boards have the opportunity to set these standards um, and it's an opportunity that we can't afford to waste. We can reinforce our demand for accountability, for trust, you know, for our governments to be proactive and forward thinking, um, to allow our economies to position themselves um, to face emerging risks head on. Because unfortunately, I don't think COVID is going to be the last um, very challenging period that we're going to have moving forward. So how do we get our boards to think more consistently um, that way? I think it starts with making sure we have the right people sitting around the boardroom table, the right people to serve as stewards of our organizations. Um, these have to be individuals you know, whose personal integrity cannot be, be questioned, who have strong ethics, diverse perspectives, um, and who have the ability to never succumb to groupthink. That is the, the death of, of any board if it seeks to really be able to drive the right conversations and make the right decisions. Um, and let's not forget the fundamental need to have directors be willing to put in the time and the work and have the time um, to invest in their roles. So understanding these goals and, and how our business leaders view the opportunities that they have and their own performances um, and then being able to identify what areas we need to improve on, I think is a, a very good place for us to start. So in my few minutes this morning, <clears throat> I'd like to start by us taking a quick overview of OECD key principles, which we all know all too well, literally 60 seconds, only as a means of then moving on to where we are currently in the, the growth and the, the development of guidelines, looking at ISO 37,000 and then the legislative framework very briefly that we're all very familiar with. Um, I think then it's important before we look at the results of the feedback given to us by directors that we understand what substantive corporate governance and ESG need to mean to us within the current environment. The need to create this level of true sustainable value so that we can see the long-term benefits um, for our corporations, for our organizations, our society, and our economies within the Caribbean region. Um, you know, at all times, we have the opportunity for all of these realities to educate and inform and influences, influence the choices that we make in our boardrooms. And at all times, these need to be ethical, um, even if they're difficult, um, and that's not that's not a real challenge if the right people are sitting around our boardroom tables. We then will take a quick look um, at what I think are some of the highlights coming out of our, our recent governance survey within the Caribbean. 
again, giving us the opportunity to, to understand where we are um, and what are our strengths and our weaknesses as we, we try to move in the right direction in terms of governance in the region. We surveyed almost 200 directors from across the region. Um, and I think it gives us a good snapshot of what it means for the current and future um, governance within the Caribbean region. So first, uh, a very, very quick look at the evolving principles. 60 seconds, we are all very familiar with the OECD principles that speak to six key areas. The first being the governance framework, um, and the treatment of shareholders and speaking to what it takes for a board to function effectively when considering these two spaces. Next, the impact of an, uh, the impact of and on, on, on institutional investors and stock exchanges um, and the rights of other stakeholders. How boards need to take these into consideration is the fourth um, principle um, that forms part of the, the OECD six principles. And finally, disclosure and transparency and the responsibilities of boards. These six areas are the key areas that the OECD established as, as areas that boards need to focus on in order to develop governance practices um, and policies that drive the right behaviors and the right decision-making processes. So coming out of the OECD principles, we continue to build and develop based on how our societies, our economies are developing and what the needs of our boards are to be effective within those spaces. Um, ISO 37000 builds on the historical developments within the governance space. I, I think we can consider it sort of the next generation of governance guidelines. The purpose of, of the International Organization for Standardization or ISO is, is to facilitate international trade. So as a result of that, it's governance um, focus tries to give stakeholders across the world um, tools it need, they need to understand if different organizations are well governed. And so stakeholders are then able to understand if they want to do business with an organization based on a standard approach um, to governance. ISO 37000 for the first time um, gives us a common global language um, for organizations. And there are three imperatives forming part of this approach. First is the establishment of effective governance conditions. And these are meant to be owned by all parties within the organization. Next is the adoption of good governance principles by the board as the governing body. And then the overall achievement of intended governance outcomes by the organization as a whole. Um, is one of the, it's a third imperative coming out of ISO 37000. So it gives us um, an approach that can be used by all organizations and applicable regardless of, of the size, um, the location, the structure or the purpose, whether profit or nonprofit focused, all organizations can make good use of, of, of ISO 37000. And this is, this is a, I think, a good um, visual of how ISO 37 is intended to work. It represents this updated approach to governance with purpose, the purpose of an organization being at the core, being at its center. It shows that at the heart of every organization should be its purpose. What is the meaningful um, reason that that organization has identified for its, its existence. It's, it's not dissimilar to all of us as, as human beings. An organization should, at, at its core, understand what its purpose is. Um, values then inform both the purpose and the way the purpose is achieved. So ISO 37 sets out guidance to help governing bodies clarify what their purpose um, and their values are. Um, it also helps to ensure that its strategy then becomes aligned with that intent um, and helps to ensure that value is generated for all stakeholders um, to achieve that purpose in line with its values. It reinforces, I think, what the critical need is for effective oversight because the starting point is purpose and there's enough flexibility built into the approach to allow it to be one that truly addresses 
long-term sustainability and the needs of and the, the needs of all stakeholders and the impact that an organization has on those stakeholders. So this is really, as I said, I consider this to be the next generation of, of guidance um, in terms of, of governance. And we continue to build on, which is it's it's good to see that we continue to think these things through. Governance is not stagnant. Governance has to grow with our society, with our organizations, meet the needs of stakeholders. And that is part of what ISO seeks to address. Legislation is a baseline. Seven duties of a director across the Commonwealth continue um, to be consistent to act within the board's constitution, to promote the success of the company, to exercise independent judgment, reasonable care, skill, and diligence. Diligence are at the core of director behavior, avoiding conflicts, not accepting benefits, and obviously declaring interests um, in transactions that can cause behaviors to be less than ethical. The UK Companies Act goes further, section 172, um, states the need for directors to consider a company's impact on a wide stakeholder group as part of its successful um, operation. It speaks to a movement toward environmental, social, and governance views of, of strategy and, and overall success of a company. So 172 defines company success as promoting the interests of shareholders but while taking account of a diverse group of stakeholders. Um, I, obviously, this gives color and, and substance to the you know, decades long discussion and argument as to whether stakeholder interests need to be taken into consideration or, with, or if a board should only be seeking the financial benefits of, of a corporation for the benefit of, of shareholders. I think it's very possible that we'll see similar um, provisions in, in other Commonwealth law in the near future. So substantive corporate governance and ESG. Um, what are the steps our private sector companies need to consider in creating true sustainable value? What does substantive corporate governance, not tick the box governance look like? Um, I think a quick look at, at this as well will help us to better appreciate the feedback that we got from our Caribbean directors, um, which is what we'll, we'll look at in, in a few minutes. But first then, what is the, what is the background um, against which we asked our almost 200 directors very pertinent questions um, as to how they intend to drive substantive governance and ESG um, within the Caribbean region? Where are we? Right now, I think it's safe to say that our regional privately owned companies are only vaguely, if at all, focused on, on governance initiatives. Our regional listed companies and financial institutions are more engaged, um, especially over, I would say, the last five to seven years, but there is still work to be done. Um, internationally, most private sector companies, whether they're privately owned or publicly listed, they're in line with governance principles, but some more in form and, than substance, um, but the discussion is so, so common now that it, at a minimum it's in form. Um, but we also need to consider what is helping to drive those discussions. A lot of that is because of the shift in our understanding of what is to be considered the value of a corporation or another organization. The ESG imperative, um, it demands that we acknowledge that if we are to operate in an ethical manner, our boards need to consider value um, within the context of a, a, a dual definition, not a strict interpretation of, of financial value. The first obviously is the economic value um, that we can derive from an enterprise, but the second is an emotional value the importance of the things that, that we hold dear to us as individuals or collectively as a, as a society. Um, there are, there's serious value to be derived from our view of, of how we protect each other, how we protect um, our environment um, and our society as a whole. So we have to strike that balance between accountability and, and the encouragement of enterprise then to, to create 
true success and, and true value. Um, as part of, of that view of value, you know, as, as Professor King pointed out to us almost a year ago, many of you may have, have attended that session, he reminded us that the board serves as the mind, the heart, and the conscience of a company. And so the ethical behavior of our directors is what gives our organizations um, the ability to have that conscience and to act responsibly and ethically. In terms of substantive corporate governance, again, what got us here? What is driving that far more um, in-depth discussion? COVID, racial tensions, our consumer base voting with their wallets and refusing to accept anything less than behavior that is considered to be ethical and that has a focus that is long-term, sustainable, and understands that capital is, is invested not only by shareholders, but also by society, by society and by the environment who all provide forms of capital to organizations. Consumers are not willing to, to look beyond um, bad behavior and only to accept those organizations who are, are seen to be doing right by society and by the environment. Activist shareholders, investors and lenders, um, you know, who, who want a broader view of non-financial metrics so that they can better understand what the risks are that are associated with a company, rating agencies, um, and of course, then governments who have made commitments to, to limit carbon emissions. Um, these are increasingly being backed by, by regulations and new taxes. And I think we're, chances are we'll see some of that coming our way in the Caribbean over the next few years. So what are the new measures of success coming out of that? Um, ESG isn't new, but it's, it's being reimagined because of those driving forces. Um, and the new measures then become environmental sustainability, societal impact, employee engagement, and the, the value of your external partnerships, your supply chains. How do you ensure that you, not only your behavior, but the behavior of those with whom you do business as an organization um, are setting the right tone, are showing ethical considerations and the right decisions that seek to protect all stakeholders. And the market is recognizing this. It's clear that, um, you know, investors are more and more leveraging those new measures of success um, to determine what the market value of, of an enterprise is on the stock exchanges of the world. So, this is a snapshot of, of S&P's view, um, according to, to Ocean Tomo, um, which is an intellectual capital merchant bank. Look at how the picture has changed between 1975 and 2020. And somewhere between the 20th and the 21st century, you sort of see a, a tipping point. So more and more of these intangible assets and the impact of an organization on the environment and the environment on the organization, these things um, have become more and more vital. Um, investors have asked tough questions um, that have led to, to these figures so that by 2020, 90% of, of the market value of these companies was considered uh, to be um, comprised of intangible assets. So based on all of that, what are the next steps that we need to consider within our organizations, within our companies, our private sector companies within, within the region? Um, I think stakeholders are essentially calling for three things. They're calling for us as a private sector to be entrepreneurial and to consider how we need to strategically reinvent, um, maybe partially, maybe completely, um, to assess our progress against these new metrics and, and redeploy our limited resources um, to achieve a purpose that is driven by new values and, and ethical behavior. Um, how will our boards choose to respond to that is the question. Um, this has to include entrepreneurship, you know, creating new products and sources and markets to, to drive a business within a new reality. Um, our boards need to strategize as to how best to use their resources to do this. Coming out of that, then there has to be some level of transformation. 
um, whether it's partial or, or wholesale, it, that will largely depend on the type of business. And in many instances, that's going to take some time um, so that the financial fallout isn't catastrophic, especially within the context of our developing economies in the region. And globally, the reality is that all of this, these shifts, all of these changes, all of this new understanding of what is valuable has to result in us wanting measures of that. How do we report, how do we measure and how do we then report um, so that stakeholders are clear as to what progress is being made by each organization. That is going to call for reimagined reporting. Um, and I think it's, it's full steam ahead in that space with the IFRS and the ISSB um, leading the way. So a lot of change. And what drives the E in ESG, um, you know, the flip side of, of the entrepreneurship is cost. There's still a cost associated with driving the E, the S, and the G. Um, I think though that probably around boardroom tables and C-suite tables right now, the biggest conversation is around the environmental cost. Um, I think that's probably getting the most, most attention in terms of the cost attributed to that. Um, you know, reaching net zero, you know, a state where our global systems um, emit only as much carbon as they can absorb, that is going to be our biggest collective human challenge that I think any of us will ever see. Um, it, is, it is one that is going to call for all hands on deck. And although we in the region know um, that we contribute <laughs> probably um, very little compared to bigger players. We feel the brunt of it. That is true, but that is not um, an excuse for us to not do our part. It's very difficult to hold others accountable if we cannot ourselves demonstrate that we are, are taking every opportunity um, to step up and, and deal with, with the issue at hand. Um, it's difficult because 84% of the world's energy still comes from fossil fuels, but we have to face it. We have to, to deal with it head on. How do we do that? I think there are four areas that, um, that need to, to work in tandem. Um, and this is a flywheel of progress that has been, been put forward by some folks within our, our network that I think is a useful um, snapshot of, of the things that are going to drive success um, in meeting the challenge of, 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 our, of our net net zero targets. So it's going to take a huge amount of innovation and product development. It's then going to take functioning markets, um, you know, where businesses have the ability to exercise their creative powers and, and to deliver green transition at the right speed because time is of the essence, obviously, um, in this scenario. Um, we need governments to put forward the right policies, the right regulations to incentivize the process, to incentivize the actions aligned with meeting net zero targets. And then as much as we, we put it on governments, we all also have to support the will being there. So the political and the public will um, for deep change around, um, around the, the, the transformation that's needed to, to save our environment. Um, is vital, and that includes around the boardroom table. Um, our directors have to do their part in doing what is ethically right um, to address to address this issue. So, a lot going on, um, and what does this mean then for how we move forward? The E, I think we all have to take within our private sector companies around our boardroom tables, take our own individual steps toward addressing environmental issues. I, again, I'm the first to admit that we, we feel victimized. We feel that we, within the Caribbean, we are not causing the problem, but that we are to a large extent feeling it um, and that our very existence is, is being threatened. Um, but that aside, we have to do our own part um, to address the issue. It's very difficult to allow, to give our leaders the opportunity to go out there onto the global stage and demand accountability and demand action if we aren't at least doing our part. The S facing societal challenges head on and whether that's within our organizations, our teams, um, from, from the most junior to the most 
senior executive and around our boardroom table, dealing with head on facing the challenges of, of, um, of discrimination, whether it's race, gender, um, diversity or inclusion, these things have to be addressed and our boards have to lead the way within our private organizations to allow the right behaviors and the right decisions to trickle down. And then the G setting the example of good governance, um, accountability, honesty, transparency. Um, these things have to be led by our boards um, within our organizations for us to make true progress in that space. So I wanted to, to touch on those things to allow us then to have a, a sort of background or a backdrop to look at what the responses were of our directors within the region when we asked them questions very much along the lines of the things that we've just touched on. Understanding those strategic goals of economic, environmental and social value creation, um, and then understanding how our leaders view their performance I think puts us in a good position to understand where we are and the things we need to do to move forward. Um, so in 2021, late 2021, um, we surveyed 193 directors from six Caribbean countries, um, a cross sector, uh, cross sector of section of organizations, types, organization types, um, you know, industries, sectors, um, and the, these directors were present in the Bahamas, Barbados, Grenada, Jamaica, St. Lucia, Trinidad. Um, and we asked them important questions touching on the things that we just talked about to help figure out what level of discussion is happening around our boardroom tables on those things. And the feedback suggests that our directors are very aware um, of the need to have these discussions and that they're starting to. Um, because they understand that financial results alone cannot be the, the focus of a learning, thinking, growing, ethical board. Um, unfortunately, though, it, I think the results also show that we need to pick up the pace. We're moving a little, a little slowly, and obviously there are reasons. The last couple of years, we've all been in survival mode to some extent. Um, but, but that now is a time to focus on, on how we really drive those discussions and drive good progress. So we're doing, we have the right aspirations, but we're not doing quite enough in my view, but I look forward to hearing your thoughts um, after we've taken a look at some of the, the highlights of the, the survey. So, so here we go. Our first few questions focused on board composition. So we asked, directors, when your board recruits its next, next director, what is the single most important attribute your board will, will prioritize in the search? And we ask them to select only one. We also ask them to what extent do you agree with the following statements about board diversity, whether it brings unique perspectives, enhances performance of the board, um, whether it improves relationships with investors, etc. cetera. Um, so, on the first question, industry expertise, you'll see, um, continues to be the main area of focus for board recruitment in the short term. And that's followed by risk management expertise um, and operational expertise. It's, it's, I can't say that we were completely surprised by the, the top three, especially industry expertise. Um, not surprised, but a little disappointed. Um, it's interesting though that that historical focus on financial expertise, um, a skill that I think many of our, our boards for many years have thought it necessary to be present in every director, that everybody around the boardroom table needed to be a financial expert, um, that that is now just barely etched out by gender diversity. Um, so diversity seems to be showing a bit of progress, um, but not nearly enough considering it's still at only at 11%. Um, and that 11% is a bit difficult to reconcile with the fact that 98% of our directors on the other chart, you'll see um, view diversity as bringing unique perspectives um, around the boardroom table. And also all directors, mm -hmm. almost all directors also agree that diversity stands to, to um, enhance board and strategic performance. So mm -hmm. boards were clear that these things bring value yet 
only 11% of our boards indicated that diversity would be a focus for the next round of recruitment within their own boards. Um, also of some concern is the fact that age, environmental sustainability, cyber risk, and race were, were really negligible, um, all considered to be of negligible value when it comes to looking at the, the next round of, of directors to be recruited. So I think we have a bit of work to do in giving consideration to the composition of our boards, um, but that is not going to change unless there's a shift in our long-term strategic thinking. Looking still at board composition and diversity, again, these figures show that directors view diversity as having the potential to en enhance board performance, but generally boards don't have immediate plans to fundamentally address the gaps. Um, because if you, you look here, you'll see top line left side, only 40% indicate that no such efforts um, have been made over the last two years. Um, and we saw previously that there's very little focus on this, only 11% um, for the next recruitment cycle. Uh, the leading reasons for this cited by um, directors um, are the fact that there's an over-reliance on director networks to source candidates um, and the fact that long-serving directors have a reluctance uh, to retire. You know, I, I'm of the view that that many long serving directors really have a wealth of knowledge of, of, their, of their companies and have value to bring and to contribute. They can continue to do that, but I think we do have to make an effort to balance this historical knowledge um, with diverse perspectives and new skills and new experiences so that our companies really have the ability then to respond to a wider stakeholder group, a wider stakeholder need. Um, and that then allows us to pivot where necessary to, to, um, to drive our enterprises toward long-term sustainability and, and value creation. Um, it seems the current approach might still be um, to underestimate the importance of, of, um, of that ability to understand and respond to diverse realities. You cannot respond to a, re a reality um, that you don't understand. Um, so the, the impact of younger generations really isn't, isn't being um, fully taken into consideration. Um, these perspectives really are needed around the boardroom. So the approach, the current approach based on the feedback seems to underestimate the importance of, of those shifts that are happening in what investors and other stakeholders view as valuable. We also had a look at board practices. Um, I think one invaluable tool to ensuring the effectiveness of a board is self-reflection. Boards are comprised of human beings. We all need to sit back sometimes and consider our own reality, our actions, um, our impact on others. Um, and around the boardroom table, that's no different. Um, so that's where board assessments come in. It's positive. I think to note that 50% of directors, almost 50%, um, confirmed that their boards undertook assessments within the last year. Um, but I have to point out that in 2018, when we did our first survey of Barbados directors, only 53% um, confirmed that to be the case. So there doesn't seem to be um, much of a shift where that's concerned. Uh, the results, I think, show that there's an acknowledgement of the need to assess performance. Um, and to build on strengths and weaknesses, but there's room for improvement. Um, assessments, I think most of you would agree, allow boards to, to remain as what Professor Garrett would call learning boards, um, gives them the opportunity to identify opportunities for growth and improvement. Um, but that only happens if the, if the process is, is really embraced by the chair and by others who are driving the discussion and allowing a safe space for directors to share real feedback, to internalize, to interpret, and then to come up with sound decisions as to how they're going to move forward. Um, so, you know, it has to, to be an inclusive process that's honest and, and constructive within a confidential space. Um, and coming out of that, there have to be actionable plans. 
So I think there are challenges here because 74% of, of respondents also indicated um, that they have concerns about the ability to be open and frank. I don't have those that um, that image on on the screen. I couldn't include all all of the feedback, but um, seventy four percent. If you take a, a look at our overall survey via the website, seventy four percent indicated that they have concerns that they cannot actually be frank and open in the process, um, which obviously is a is is a complete. Um, it nullifies if, if one cannot be honest and open in, in giving feedback as to one's own performance, the performance of the board, then these things cannot be identified and can't be addressed. 33% um, of respondents, unfortunately, also confirmed that no actions were taken regarding anything regarding board composition, operational practices, or otherwise as a result of, of their assessment. So although 50% of our boards did assessments, 33% out of that um, took absolutely no action. So I, in reality, I, I don't know that any board that undertakes a process like this and can identify absolutely no room for improvement in those important spaces, um, I think they, they may have missed an invaluable opportunity to learn um, and to improve their performance um, for the benefit of, of, of all of their stakeholders. This might be stemming out of a lot, you know, an initial, a lack of an initial acknowledgement um, of the value to be derived from the process. Because again, if the investment isn't there and the proper ownership from the chair, the company secretary, and all board members, um, it, it stands the chance of becoming a sort of tick the box exercise, which is not what we want. Um, another useful figure, I think, of feedback that came out of the survey um, in, in respect of assessments, a contributor to the outcome, um, maybe the fact that 70% of the assessments were actually self-assessments, which in and of itself makes it difficult um, to have that independent feedback, to have a safe space um, if everything is done internally. The level of re reflection is not the same, um, and the benchmarking and determinations of, of best practice that can be beneficial to the board. Um, those things, I think, can rarely be achieved if, if there isn't some level of independent evaluation at least every couple of years. Um, the selection coming out of an assessment process is a really fundamental way of, um, of making sure that the, the right people are sitting on your boards um, and on our boards. Um, and so that can only happen if there's is frank assessment of, of the needs of the board and the performance of the individual directors. Um, Kamla, I'm aware that I am quite over time. How would you? I'm going to try to move as quickly as I can through the next few slides, if that's all right. All right, um, we looked as well at board practices. Um, so two thirds of directors spent less than 150 hours a year on their board oversight role, and a third less than 100 hours. Um, that I don't think is enough, given the preparation and the engagement needed by a director to really play a meaningful role. Um, I think that might also be indicative of a, a more fundamental issue because 35, um, percent or more of our directors also shared concerns um, about several important areas not receiving sufficient board oversight. Um, succession planning, uh, cyber, ESG, strategy and risk, um, all are areas that our boards are not convinced that are, are, are getting sufficient attention around the boardroom table. Um, in addition, only 63% believe that their boards understand their company's strategy very well. Um, that is not on, on the screen. That's on another, another figure sheet. Um, and that fell to 59% and 33% when, when we asked about the competitive landscape and culture of the organization. We also looked at the important area of strategic focus of the board. Um, we asked directors, to what extent do you think your company should take the following issues into account when developing company strategy? 
Um, it's promising that the majority of respondents confirm that they either very much or somewhat agree that key societal and environmental issues need to be taken into account. Um, 82 to 89% of respondents were positive on the area of immigration, resource scarcity, et cetera. And that reflects an important acknowledgement of the impact, I think, of our organizations on our very delicate um, Caribbean environment and, and our close-knit societies within the Caribbean. The impact that directors and our corporations have within our environment of, of, of the Caribbean countries um, that we live in uh, is, is significant. And I think our boards appreciate that. Of concern though is the admission that only 11% of our directors think that their boards really understand the risk associated with environmental and social issues. Um, so we have some work to do there. Boards really need to question whether their composition allows them um, to properly address those issues. We looked at, at strategy risk and ESG as well by asking, in your opinion, how has COVID impacted um, your business? Um, of course, directors acknowledge that there has been a significant impact, um, and that included exposures um, of vulnerab vulnerabilities within organizations, um, especially regarding crisis response plans and failures. But 36% 30, of our directors indicated that there's been absolutely no um, indication of, of, their, of exposures as a, of vulnerabilities as a result of COVID. Looking at COVID again, we, we asked directors how they see things moving forward um, as we look to the future, you know, how, how is COVID going to impact us in the long term or medium to long term? 87% um, of our directors considered COVID as having long term impact on the way we work um, with new habits and increased reliance on technology. I don't think any of us are surprised by that, considering the forum that we're sitting in right now. Um, directors also believe though that in the medium to long term, um, the current impact on the global supply chain will taper off. Um, of course, this was pre, pre Russia and Ukraine. So there may be a different um, view now, but as of late last year, um, only 36% expect there to be a, a reduction in globalization. We asked also about the broader environment. Um, we talked in, in previously about the fact that ESG speaks to an organization's impact on the environment and society and, and how our companies and organizations need to make that, that impact positive. So we asked our directors against that backdrop um, whether they agreed with certain views on an organization's impact on the broader environment. 58% very much agreed that companies should have a social purpose. 37% only somewhat agree that that is the case. Um, I think boards or boards maybe need to question whether their corporations are ethically bound and them as individuals sitting around the table, ethically bound to take the interests of, of that wider stakeholder group into account. Because as I, as I mentioned before, our environment and our society also provide different forms of capital to an enterprise and, and those cannot be disregarded. Um, about 40% very much agree that companies should be able to be profitable while doing good in society. I wish that figure was, was higher. Uh, we'll get there. I'm confident we'll get there. But right now, only 40% of our directors feel that they can provide financial value while still um, doing good. And uh, also, unfortunately, less than 40% feel strongly that creating a di diverse workforce should be an area of focus. Work to be done there, but again, 40% is, you know, we're heading in the right direction, but we do have work to do. We do have to pick up the pace where those things are concerned. Um, in our private sector boardrooms, we've acknowledged the need for wider goals for a few years, um, but I don't know that we've made it central to our strategies yet, and that's, that's where the work needs to be done. And that I think is also reflected in the fact that only 24% of our directors consider other stakeholders to be very important in, in the making of company decisions. Um, on the positive side though, um, almost 50% of directors at least somewhat agree that consideration of a wider stakeholder group is reasonable. So we're heading in the right direction.
finally, I will wrap up now, Kamla, I promise. Um, we asked some, some important questions about how you manage um, and oversee your executive team as a, direct, as a board. Um, a, one key tool in the, the hands of a board in driving the right behaviors at the executive C-suite level um, is, the, is the structuring of compensation packages. Um, despite overall strong overall feedback that compensation packages can be used to drive the right behaviors, um, the tool seems to face some challenges within the region because our directors are not 100% sure um, that it's working the way it should. 55% have concerns that executives are already overpaid. And 40% are concerned that compensation committees are already too willing to approve very generous packages. Um, and 30% feel that performance targets are sometimes too easy to achieve. So although there's an acknowledgement of the value of the tool, we're not 100% sure that it's currently working um, as well as it can. Um, but goals set in support of the values of an organization um, are, are really vital. So we, 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 we asked directors their views on the importance of non-financial financial metrics. Um, employee engagement and attrition, um, succession planning and quality were selected as factors that are reasonably important for the motivation of, of executive teams. Um, only 49% though of directors consider this to be important um, in terms of the environment in driving the right behavior of, of execute behavior and the execution of duties by, by management. Customer satisfaction at 83% and ethical behavior at 78% were rated as the two most important factors for inclusion and compensation packages. Um, note that all directors were asked to select all that apply. So what is of concern to me is that ethical behavior is only at 78%. It seems high, but since directors had the opportunity to select up to 100% of them had the opportunity to select ethical behavior, I'm concerned that it appears that some of our directors um, as the stewards of their enterprises have to give further consideration to the most fundamental need for ethical behavior at the executive and board levels. Um, because without, without that, um, the purpose and value of an enterprise will at all times um, be in jeopardy. So with that, Kamla, I'm really looking forward to hearing from the panel and from, from others in attendance, their thoughts on this very important um, topic of, of how our private sector organizations help to drive sustainable um, growth and good strong corporate governance um, within our region. And I thank you all. I'm going to have to skip the last one, otherwise Kamala will wrap me on my knuckles. <laughs> um, I thank you all for, for your attendance and your attention. Thank you so much, Kamala. Yes, thank you, Ronal. And uh, this, I, I think, is such an absolute uh, valuable uh, uh, findings that, that you have shared with us. I, I can tell you now that uh, we will be inviting you again for a session that's going to look specifically at the, the findings of this survey. I know that uh, a lot of persons would have had a lot of questions in their minds while you were presenting uh, some of the results. So I want to say, I know it's uh, just about 12.30 now, but we can take 15 minutes of our time that we had scheduled for the break and engage in um, some of the, the discussions with you. Um, and as I put in the chat, you know, you can either put the question there if you have any or if you want to make a comment please ensure that um, you prepare to make it very brief all right now um, I, I want to get the ball rolling um, Ronald there were a number of um, areas in, in which I, I found the results to be very surprising but one of them that I wanted to ask specifically about was in terms of the um, the assessments of the board and um, the, the fact that uh, a 
at least you said 70 percent of the the participants said that the assessments were really self uh, board assessments uh was it possible to deduce from the results whether it is that they had only engaged in, in board assessments that one year or so or was it over a period of time that they were still engaging only in, in self-assessment and not having independent evaluations of the board no unfortunately not able to gauge that because of how the question was posed we only asked whether there had been an assessment in the last year mm -hmm. not not you know whether there was a cycle of independent versus um versus right. internal no Okay. So that's food, that's food for thought for the next one. Yes, for sure, because the likelihood is that uh, boards in the region are only now beginning to engage in assessments, and so they've started with the, the self-evaluation first, which yeah. generally is allowed for, for two years before you should engage in at least some um, independent assessment. So um, uh, that may be a good thing. Now, I also found the results with respect to um, the, the desire for greater diversity in the boardroom to be very surprising i would have thought that um there's such a global shift in our understanding of the value of having these different perspectives in the boardroom that that us within the caribbean we would have been a lot more open to that um so it may be that 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 the survey would not have been able to give these nuances so i want to ask you whether you think uh within the region we feel that there has been sufficient uh move towards a diversity already or whether it is that um we the boards simply feel that they don't have enough space because as you say a lot of directors really are not retiring yeah i i, I think the the feedback shows an appreciation i think oh, our directors are moving in the right direction and following global trends and understand the importance of of having the ability to understand and respond um, to a wider stakeholder group and to a diverse talent pool, a diverse um, customer base. Um, and you can only do that if people with that understanding are sitting around the table sharing their own experiences and, and giving that input. So I think we get that. Um, I think though, as you said, there is a reluctance still to take the plunge. Um, our directors have indicated that they understand that it brings those unique perspectives. They think it can enhance board performance um but but that as i said i didn't share that particular image but we do have other data that that reflects that they say you know the folks don't want to retire from the board um and they're still comfortable recruiting within their own um circles mm -hmm. um and so until they they really see the importance um to their own to the, the sustainability of the organization I think it's, it's going to take that shift in mindset to really take the plunge um, and, and make the tough decisions. And again, things like um, an assessment process help to drive the right discussions and give a chair um, the tools he or she needs to be able to, to recommend and to take steps toward diversifying a board. But, but if those open conversations aren't happening, it, it becomes difficult. Yeah. Okay. Um, Joanne, I, I see Joanne Salazar has her hand up. So Joanne, I'm going to invite you to unmute so you can make your contribution very briefly or ask a question. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Kamala. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ronel. This is a passionate area of interest of mine. I'll just ask two quick questions. Do you have a sense for now of any difference of behavior or responses for those countries that had a governance code to those that didn't? That was the first question. And the second question, did, did, were you able to gather anything, any data with regard to the independence of the non-executive directors and whether their opinions were different to the executive directors? Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Um, uh, to your first, your first question, I think that is something that we can readily 
try to pull out of the data. I cannot say to you that we've done that um, in, in the first round of analysis, but with Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad, all having codes and Bahamas, St. Lucia, Grenada not, that is something that, that we can certainly take a closer look at and slicing and dicing the information. That, that's very useful, John, thank you for that. Um, so I, I promise I can take a look at that and I can get back to you. Remind me what your second question was. Well, sorry, thank you very much for that. Um, because my, my next question would be along that line, would be you know how up to date the codes are, but then I know we've got limited time, so I won't take us down that, that rabbit hole at the moment. Mm -hmm. My second, originally my second question was to do with the independent, because ah. the, best inter, the best international guidance and our own local code talks mm -hmm. about non-executive directors not being regarded as independent after they've been on the board for nine years. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered if you saw in the data any, any, anything that would give an indication that that was being that was known or being used as a yardstick or what yardstick people were using. I'm taking I'm taking notes from both you and Kamala. The next round, <laughs> the next round of, of of other more specific questions that would be useful mm -hmm. um, to drive to drive the right data. Unfortunately, we no, we did not ask um, whether directors consider themselves to be independent or otherwise. So no, not not this round, but. That we can certainly include that the next time around because there will be another time. We have to keep, okay, great. keep, keep the momentum. We have to keep the, driving the discussion um, and right. building building on on the progress that we're making um, because I, I yeah. do believe that that if these or, organizations right. have have a vital role to play in how we move forward as a region. Yeah, and, that, and it's a bit. The second question was a bit cheeky because if people believe in staying on boards for a very long time then they're not observing any definition of independence. Mm -hmm. And the, the importance of that, as you know, is that it's only independent directors that are supposed to populate certain committees if you are adhering to good governance practice. So yes, I would look forward to, to the next round and to further discussions actually. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Joan. So we have a... a, a question and comment in the chat from Sanyu Richards. Sanyu is from the BVI. She says, why not have term limits for directors in a governance code? Analogy is with the notion, the standards of corporate governance reflecting those at national or regional levels. So is anyone indispensable? Is that for me? Well, um, oh. I think <laughs> Governance codes. Um, Maybe Marlon, <laughs> because I fully, I fully agree. Yeah. <laughs> but, yes, um, that's a but I think the codes to speak to the fact that companies need to say what the tenure of the directors are, and that generally, you know, um, uh, a lot of organizations will say that directors need may have like um, three times, you know, after which um, they, they may need special. Um, uh, authorization to continue to serve as a director. So, but I agree that that uh, possibly was not part of um, what the survey would have covered. Now, what I wanted to also raise, unless I see another um, question in the chat, was again the question of the amount of time that directors spend in terms of their their preparation. So, um, Joanne, forgive me. I'm going to mute your mic if that's okay. Um, but if you have a question again, of course, please just raise your hand. Um, so yes, that amount of time you're saying, um, you know, 150 hours, um, that is what two thirds of, of the, the responses um, suggested, uh, which sort of suggests that really there's not enough time being spent specifically for important um, responsibilities with respect to their oversight and um, that was followed to with the fact that uh, um, a lot of the board members believed that not all of the directors understood their strategies very well. So, so there may very well be a correlation yeah. in, in that area. Yeah, that's, that's our interpretation. Yeah, be, because remember that 150, 100, 150 hours um, includes preparation, attendance, committees, 
Mm. So that, be, you know, that those hours then get stretched. Um, and then when on the flip side, you know, we say, is, is the board paying enough attention to these very important areas um, or, or not? And then we get that feedback on succession planning and, and cyber mm -hmm. ESG strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it almost 40% of our directors said um, that strategy is not getting sufficient board time and attention. Um, I think that's, that's okay, cool for I thought. See, yeah, I see Joanne, you have another question. I'm just fascinated by this. Did you pick up any data on overboarding right now? I was about to ask the same question. Yes. How, many yeah. board, we're, we're, how many boards do you sit on? Nope, one more thing yeah. next time. <laughs> I need to talk. I need to talk to you offline because I'm I'm doing some research in this area myself. So I have a I have a, a mountain of questions to ask. But we're well done for for the work, and I do believe in letting the data do the talking, and I think that's the, the right approach that that you're taking. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I I too think that this is an extremely invaluable exercise and that we need to dedicate an entire um, CCGI session to look at mm -hmm. the, the results of the survey and uh, being able to interpret it because and also Ronel I think we need to really work hard to reach out to a lot more of our directors because if your result is saying that a lot of them feel that they don't understand ESG very well then um, they will benefit from attending a lot of our sessions. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the whole purpose of, of you know, putting in the time and effort with something like like this. Is it's it's a platform for driving discussion, um, and I think the results show that there's the will is there, the momentum now needs um, to happen, and we need to pick pick up the pace. <laughs> Um, so that we can really, really benefit from all that our organizations have to have to offer the, the region. I think that is an excellent note on which we can close um, this opening presentation today, um, Dronal. Thank you so very much. I, I think it really, um, it, it shows how much work we have to do at CCGI as well in building our own visibility you know, to encourage more persons to be involved in the conversation so that it, it builds their own um, awareness and competence as well. So, so I want to encourage everyone who is here in the room, please share the word as well. Each one, each one, bring one in, you know, and, and that way we would continue to build.